Have you? Yeah. Do all of you work? This is, yeah, it's Mac. I am. Okay, I'll probably run a twisted wave on there. Can you see that? are open. Excellent. We are live. And you guys have any more objects I can put right here? Um, here, I can put my glass there. Thanks, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little cluttered. <laughs> it feels like home. All right. <sighs> You're right. It doesn't bleed. It's like watching the drawing show backwards. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to interpret what that. I'm trying to interpret what that means. You can interpret in so many ways. Uh, um, okay. Well, there's no audience to ask questions, so we don't have to worry about that. And um, headset here. Oh, headset's good. Yep. Okay. Um, okay. No problem. We'll be with you momentarily. Um, now we've frozen. No, because she's probably outputting something. She's else. working on something. Yeah. NDI, NDI gets wonky when she's setting up a shot in NDI. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder if that's when it. <laughs> okay, NDI is working. Um. Okay. Double checking the live stream. Um, is it working? It says live. It's just a really big latency. Mm. One. Okay, two. it is. Yeah, it's like ten seconds. No, okay, it's not too bad. It's fine. I don't. <laughs> okay. Just want to make sure it was really working. All right. And is our chat room there, Jack? Are they alive? Alrighty. And the Facebook chat is... The Facebook maybe, chat may be the more dominant one tonight. Probably. Okay. Ready when you are. Hey! It's Monday night! And, uh... <laughs> what? <laughs> And guess what? It's time for voiceover body shop again. We have a legend with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Guy whose voice you hear everywhere. You know, if if you especially if you got cable. A lot of people are pulling cable, but if you got cable and you watch Animal Planet and Discovery Channel and all these other you know this guy's voice. If you go to the movies, you cannot avoid his voice. If you voice. grew up in the eighties, you know this guy's voice. Or maybe in the seventies. A little bit of both. Some of us a little earlier than that. Yeah. Uh Bill Ratner is with us tonight, and his lovely daughter, Ariana. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about their family business. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All righty. And we've got, uh, we've got tech news, and we're going to discuss setting proper levels, because, boy, we get a lot of questions. This should it. take a minute, but it won't. No. Because, you know, we'll unpack a few things. That's right. And, uh, and uh, tech news this week? Meh. We'll find something. All righty, all that and more and your questions coming up on VoiceOver Body Shop. Two men, twin sons from different mothers with a passion for voiceover recording technology and the desire to make recording easy for voice actors everywhere. Together in one place. George Whittem, the home studio engineer to the stars, a Virginia Tech grad with an unmatched knowledge of all the latest gear and technology in voiceover today. Dan Leonard, the home studio master, a voice actor with over 30 years experience in broadcasting and recording, and a no holds barred myth busting attitude for teaching you how easy it is. Together, to bring you all the latest technology, today's voiceover superstars and leading the discussion on how to make the most of your voiceover business. This is VoiceOver Body Shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com. 
home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products. Source Elements, remote connections made even easier. VO2GoGo.com, everything you need to be a successful voiceover artist. J. Michael Collins Demos, award-winning demo production. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your voiceover website won't be a pain in the butt. And VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live from their super secret multimedia studio in Sherman Oaks, California, here are George Whittem and Dan Leonard. Good evening. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop. Or VO. B.S. All righty. Well, here we are on another Monday night. Bill Ratner's our guest and his daughter, Ariana. We're going to have a very interesting time talking to them. He's got a new book out, too, mm -hmm. called Parenting in the Digital Age. So This is the uh, yeah, yeah. question of the ages right now. Yes. All of us having children, we know what it's like to uh, make sure that we don't have problems with our children because we used television as a babysitter that's right mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately i watched way too much teletubbies <laughs> uh do you remember how teletubbies were rerun at like one in the morning on pbs for a while don't don't ask me why <laughs> i you if you've seen it you might maybe know why it's kind of like an the parents who work the late shift you know <laughs> i remember once hearing this one guy complain on pbs or on npr go, this is a terrible show i don't understand sir it's for toddlers <laughs> And stoners, and, yeah. and you must not be either. So <laughs> hopefully not. Anyway, um, we've got uh, we've got a great, great guest. We've got questions, and if you have a question for us, a technical question about your home voiceover studio, mm -hmm. send it into the chat room on Facebook or on our page, and Jack Daniel will get that to us, and we will answer that question, whether correctly or not. It doesn't matter as long as you're entertained. Please ask questions, or it's going to be a really short show. No, well, not that short. No, oh, that's right. Bill's here. Bill's here. I mean, we'll, that'll we'll carry it on no matter what. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's now time for... Voice of a Body Shop presents the VOBS Voice Over Extra News. All the information you need for a successful voiceover career. And now here is the voiceover extra news for October 1st, 2018. How to stand out. Okay, what makes a voice actor stand out from the competition? It could be louder, I guess. If your first thought is a great voice, well, sort of. But that's only a part of the answer. Let's talk about standing out in two areas. Hmm. In business and performance. Because to be a success... To make a living in this biz, you need to stand out in both. Last week, VoiceOver Extra again shared wisdom from longtime voice actor Paul Strickwerda on how to stand out in business. Paul creatively presents this as a mock interview that puts you on TV's Shark Tank program, attempting to <laughs> entice the rich panelists to invest in your VO business. And one of the investor Paul's and one of investor Paul's questions is something. You might not have expected. He asks, who does your business make money for? Well, if you answer, me, <laughs> well, you're wrong. You're in business to make money for your voiceover clients, right? If your voice works for them, they'll appreciate and return to you time and time again. As an investor, Paul says, number one, I'd look for your ability to make me money, even if you work with a not-for-profit. Paul explains, it's always a matter of benefits and costs. The benefits of hiring you should outweigh how much your clients pay. If that's the case, those clients will perceive you as an asset and not as an expense. There's more in Paul's article, but let's turn now to what will make you stand out in performance. And that's addressed in a new article from top voice talent and coach Kate McClanahan of Actors Sound Advice. Now, in this article, Kate offers seven ways to stand out. And number one, it's the ability to be you. Kate says, the irony is that many of us spend six to eight years or more training to become someone else as actors. 
But the primary thing being asked of us once we're out in the field is just be ourselves. Being you, she says, is the most desirable thing you can be. Everyone on the page and everything on the page should sound like it's occurred to you rather than the client putting words in your mouth, Kate adds. And come to think of it, doesn't that relate back to Paul's business question of how you can make money for your clients? There are many more pointers in these articles, and you can check them out right now after this particular show at voiceoverextra.com. It's your daily resource for standing out in voiceover. Fantastic. And that's the news, the All way right. it is, All October right. 1st. It's October 1st. Yeah, I think we just went July, August, August October. October. Yeah, it's Boom. gone. September yeah. September didn't exist for a lot of people, apparently. <laughs> Things were pretty slow. It's the end of the third quarter, and I think the beginning of the fiscal year for a lot of companies. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if your business has been slow, if you're you're not seeing as many auditions or as many as many jobs out there. Don't it, freak out yet. No, it's Don't October. Freak out yet. Yeah, no, because the holiday stuff is coming in now and companies are starting to go, okay, we need to talk about the fall. And we need to spend money. Please spend as much as you can <laughs> on voice talent. Yes. So what's up in tech this week? Well, I'm really start off with just sort of a basic tech tip overall. And okay. that is making sure that on your computer, whether it, uh, this has been an issue with Mac because it's mainly what I deal with the most often, but probably affects Windows computer users as well. And that is try to avoid letting sleep interrupt your computer. That thing that happens when you shut the lid or when you walk away from the monitor for a while and the screen goes black. And there's a couple kinds of sleep. So let's talk about first screen sleep or dis display sleep. Okay. Display sleep, not a problem. Display sleep will save some energy. It will reduce the temperature in your booth so the screen isn't on. The screen, the screen won't burn out. Right. Not that that happens a whole lot anymore. Screen but... burn-in is kind of a thing of the past, but it, it will, it, it, that's not a bad thing. So if you're in your energy server on the Mac, there used to be two sliders. One was for display sleep and one was for computer sleep. Now, in the newer Mac systems, because Apple wants to make everything simpler, there is no longer a computer sleep. There's only a display sleep thing you can control, which is the delay until it goes to sleep. But you can say, don't put the computer to sleep when the screen goes to sleep. And why is that important? Because a lot of audio interfaces, especially USB interfaces, or maybe primarily USB interfaces, don't like that very much. Because when the computer goes to sleep, or hibernation or whatever it is, if your interface is powered by the computer, like mm -hmm. a Scarlet or anything that just plugs in with USB, it doesn't, it, it basically the computer outputs a lower power output or something funky like that. And that can turn off the peripheral. Yeah, or freak it out. <laughs> like, and, and we've seen a lot of that. Not lately. entirely yeah. turn it off, but right. like part, like it just it gets wonky as all get out. So it's really good idea to not sleep your computer. So it, if you if you just don't want to have to shut everything down every time you're done using the computer, you know if you're if you're a power miser, I understand shut it down, but don't sleep. I tend to leave my computer up, and what I do is before any mission critical thing, I just restart it. Right, but I, you I, still I, leave all those windows open that you leave open. Right? Oh, of course, I have it set to <laughs> restore all windows. I have Chrome set to restore all the tabs, all seventy four whatever tabs okay. I have open. <laughs> But, you know, the key thing is restarting the machine gives it a massive refresh and it ref flushes the memory and it just everything works better after a restart. So even if you're not going to shut it off at the, at the end of the day, at the very least, restart it in the morning. And guess what I figured out just recently? I don't know why I just, just figured this out. Do tell. You can set your computer to do this for you. No. Yes. In, in, the, <laughs> uh, in the energy settings, there's a scheduler button at the bottom and you can go in there and say, Restart my computer every day at 6 a.m., for example. So even if you're not the one that's going to think to do it, the computer will force you to restart. And that way, every time you walk into your studio, your computer will be on with a fresh startup, theoretically. Cool. That's not always going to work. Right. And I'll explain why. If you leave, if you're one of those people that records things and then leaves temp files open, like untitled, right? Twisted Wave, for example, won't let the computer shut down. Because it'll be sitting there going, do you want me to save this man? Mm -hmm. And it'll just sit there <laughs> and the computer will never restart. So you do have to close stuff for this to work. Right. But if you close things when you're done, the computer will restart. Either way, it'll remind you next time you sit down, it'll be sitting there going, hey, do you want me to save this? And then, and then it'll restart. But 
I'm telling you, it clears up so many problems in your system if you can restart it and avoid sleeping. It's the biggest thing I can say. Okay. So at night, turn my computer off, not just close it up and charge it up. That's You can do that. You can turn it off. Yeah. You, but if you're going to leave it on like I do, you just, just restart it. Okay. You know, you can leave it on, but give it a re a fresh startup in the morning. I, I you know, I, I'm not at my computer every day. I use my laptop a lot, but if I'm gonna do a webinar, you better believe it. Fresh reboot. Make sure the machine's, you know, got a clean, clean slate inside. Uh, mine's overdue for about a week or so. It's <laughs> you know what? It's amazing how long it'll run. They though. do sometimes. I'll... Another cool thing, and I this, I like these little follow up stories because okay. I hear more about these products, is that Skyrim puck. Yes. Um, that's that thing that Joe Cipriano discovered and then to ask me if it's any good. And I said, I don't know, man, get one and find out. He took it to Europe. It was awesome. Um, now I have a client, David Kay, who is in Russia and he's using his Skyrim to be on the internet and it's working great. He's doing sessions. I'm not sure who was listening in on it, but yeah. <laughs> but, um, I, I, I wanted to bring this story up, especially because Bill is here. Years ago, Bill was planning a trip to uh, to Europe, a couple different countries, I think, and we were like, how are we solving the internet problem? And we, we were trying all kinds of out there ideas. We were talking about satellite. You know, you can get these little satellite antennas about the size of a laptop, right. but the line of sight would be a nightmare in like yeah. Venice with other buildings right <laughs> up, you know, which just wouldn't work. But this thing, it's not satellite, but cellular, cellular, cellular coverage in a lot of Europe is very good yeah. Um, because their infrastructure is so crappy and old that they've re- been relying on cell networks for a lot longer than we have. Like right. they, they, they really rely on it. So the coverage there is really good. And Joe said it worked everywhere. He was doing Source Connect on this thing. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if David's been doing Source Connect on it, but he's he's been using, he's like, he wrote me a message on Facebook saying, we're on a tour bus right now in Russia and I'm, I'm on Facebook on my wow. Skyrim, you know, I'm not having to worry about being, you know, is it totally secure? Nothing is completely secure, but it's way more secure than being on any kind of a public Wi-Fi access point, which is the last thing you want to do in any questionable countries. Right. Including this one. Yeah. Well, this is, <laughs> don't be on a public is, Wi-Fi. This is on here. that list now. You know, okay. it's not as bad as quite as bad as Russia, but it's still, you know, we, yeah, it's not a good, I think to a good thing to be on public Wi-Fi. using a hotspot on your own phone is a really good choice. Um, I'm still experimenting with Project Fi. The good and the bad of it, the good is once you hit your six gigabyte uh, data cap, they basically, instead of cutting you off, they say, the rest's on us. Well, totally different special? business. So like yeah. for the next, for the rest of the month, they don't bill you anymore. Wow. Pretty cool. And I've blown through it already. I'm at 12 gigs I've used. I used my Project Fi to stream music on Spotify for a DJed karaoke bicycle chariot that we towed all around LA yesterday, streaming music and YouTube the whole day. Wow. Hot spot on this phone. Wow. It was it was really nice. amazing and it, and it worked. The downside of Project Fi has been this call quality is not up to Verizon standards. I've gotten spoiled, but Verizon is really good driving through Topanga Canyon all the way. Yeah. And this one is very, it, it, you can use it, but it's crackly and it's, it's not solid. So mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to keep it for the long run, but they, it works. Yeah, they need more cell towers in Topanga that are disguised as pine trees. Or... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the canyon is so narrow and windy that, that the cell towers are literally on the poles. Mm-hmm. So they only work for about 150, 200 feet. And you ah. go around a corner, and then you're on the next cell tower. That's that's how it is in those areas. Cool. But anyway, a couple right. little tech story follow-ups. Very good. You came up with more than you thought you would. You know, <laughs> you just have just... to get a little coffee and a little kickstart, and off I go. And here we go. All righty. Well, Bill Rotner is going to be with us in just a couple of minutes, along with his daughter, Ariana, and we're going to discuss something very important right here on this very show, right after these messages. So don't go away. Hmm. They hot ribbed for her pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's VOBS.TV. Uh, yeah, it is. Alrighty. Just let me know. You're watching VOBS.TV. I don't know why. It's crazy what they do here. I think I'm going to go somewhere else and have a cheese sandwich. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on VoiceOver Body Shop. 
do you think about your voiceover career? Are you frustrated with your lack of success, wishing you had more auditions and bookings and making more money? We all have thoughts like, I'm not good enough to be doing this professionally. I'm just faking it. I need to join the union as soon as I can. I'm too old to get booked. I can't get started until everything is perfect. You get that one. Mm -hmm. I hate auditioning because I never book anything. Sound familiar? If only you could change your mindset and get rid of these ridiculous rules. Well, VO2GOGO's David H. Lawrence the 17th has just what you need. He's completed a 21-day journey with nearly 100 VO and on-camera talent, just like you. And it's called Believe 2018. And he recorded every single session, meaning you can take this journey now at the pace you want and change things for the better. Get the success you deserve by destroying your limiting beliefs and replacing them with powerful, productive, enabling beliefs. And do so on your schedule. Here's the link. Go get the 25 hours of video and audio, the daily chat logs, and more, and begin your own journey. The link is vo2gogo.com forward slash believe. That's vo, the number two, gogo.com forward slash believe. It's ridiculously cheap, and it's ridiculously effective. Once again, vo2gogo.com forward slash believe. As a voice talent, you have to have a website. But what a hassle getting someone to do it for you. And when they finally do, they break or don't look right on mobile devices. They're not built for marketing and SEO. They're expensive. You have limited or no control. And it takes forever to get one built and go live. So what's the best way to get you online in no time? Go to voiceactorwebsites.com. Like our name implies, voiceactorwebsites.com just does websites for voice actors. We believe in creating fast, mobile-friendly, responsive, highly functional designs that are easy to read and easy to use. You have full control. No need to hire someone every time you want to make a change. And our upfront pricing means you know exactly what your costs are ahead of time. You can get your voiceover website going for as little as $700. So if you want your voice actor website without the hassle of complexity and dealing with too many options, go to voiceactorwebsites.com where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. And we're back here on VoiceOver Body Shop talking about voiceover home studio technology, which is, face it, guys, 15 years ago, it didn't exist. I mean, I there were a few guys with, you know, Otari reel-to-reels, and they're throwing their tapes into FedEx things. I'll bet you Bill did that. People See? that Bill taught how to record. That's right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all changed. It's all digital now, and anybody can do it. It doesn't mean anybody can do it or should do it. <laughs> should is the word I'm thinking. I, yeah, should is probably the more <laughs> operative word there. But if you need help setting up your home studio, or if you have trouble with your home studio, there's only two places you can go that are it's going to give you the most experience on the mm. face of God's green earth, and that is me or George, <laughs> because that's what we do. We've worked with so many people, and, you know, it, it's like, yeah, I know a lot about it when I started, but after doing this for 15 years, mm. you think we've gained a little bit of experience and knowledge in how to do it. So if you want to work with George, and he will now explain to you all the things that he does, mm. go to... I'll keep it short. Okay. GeorgeTheTech.com. It's a great website, hopefully well-organized with lots of helpful information and a lot of different ways that I can help you. It's all there. Things starting as low as 25 bucks on up to... Building your dream studio and everything in between. And Dan, they can find you over at homevoiceoverstudio.com. And, uh, and I, you know, I do the same kind of stuff. I work a lot with beginners, people who really don't know their microphone from their interface or various other things. And uh, we'll teach you how to get it done right and make sure it sounds the way it's supposed to sound like. Whistle which drives you nuts every time I say it. Uh, and also, if you want to check out your audio to see how it's working, you can go to my Specimen Collection Cup on my homepage, click on that, and you can, for 25 bucks, I will analyze your audio and see if perhaps you need a little tweaking or a little more help. So, anyway, go to those websites. You can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. We're the guys that know how to do it, which is why we're here. 
giving you away lots of information. Like this little piece of, this little tidbit of information and knowledge that will change the way you record. Because in the radio days, and not all of you were in radio, as a matter of fact, the majority of you are like, what? We, we used to sit there and we would ride the levels. You know, we'd have our headphones on, kick on the mic, and kick off the monitor. Well, monitors would, would turn off, so you had to hear what you were saying. Mm -hmm. And when the music ended and stuff. Yep. And then you would start talking, and then your hand would be on the dial, and you'd, like, you'd ride the, the levels mm -hmm. you know, in the VU meter. Well, it's all different now today. Uh, but because we understood what proper modulation was when, you know, when I started doing voiceover and recording, it was like, oh, full modulation. You also had to be a lot more, it was a lot more critical. Um, yeah. cause you had to like get the level in this small dynamic range, this small part of the meter right. to get the best, uh, signal to noise ratio. Right. right. So you want to get it nice and hot level and get it over the hiss of right. the tape and everything else and all that gear that's in the studio. Yeah. And now because we're recording digitally, we have this huge dynamic range, right. and it's very quiet, and we can be more conservative on the levels a little bit and right. not have to be, like, riding the game constantly and making right. sure we're always in that last... You shouldn't be paying any attention to any of that stuff when you're recording. Mm -hmm. The black and white on the page is what you're supposed to be concentrating yeah. on, and whatever it is in your brain that's saying, how do I make it sound like I'm not reading this? Mm -hmm. Who am I talking to? Who am I? That yeah. sort of thing. So all those things that they teach you and all those voice acting classes you're all taking. Uh, but the question that we get a lot of, and when we, when we get samples from people, is, is their modulation is way too low. Mm. And let's go to our DAW view, 2018 view here, Susan, so we can mm. see what we're talking about here. Stretching the limits of webcasting technology, Voice Over Body Shop presents DAW view 2018. Oh, how I've missed that. Me too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, here, here's, a, here's an example of a file on, uh, on Twisted Wave. And you can see that I have set different, different waveforms here. And, for example, this one here, that's a little high. Mm -hmm. If your levels are like that all the way across, it's too high. Yeah, you're in that last 5%, 10%. You might even be clipping. You're almost, almost. Now, digital digital recording gives you the ability to, it gives you a little bit more headroom than no, normally would. I wonder oh, who that could be. Let's put him on the phone. Uh, oh, ladies it's, and gentlemen. It's Larry Hudson. Larry Hudson, why are you calling me during my show? God, why am I doing that? Am I so stupid? Yes. <laughs> I love that you guys answer when you're on the show. Hey, listen, I have an offer for you. So you would call me after. It's a kind of a big deal. Okay. All right. All right. All right. See you later. Larry Hudson, ladies <laughs> and gentlemen. <laughs> call now. All right. That's hilarious. Yes. Anyway, so we were talking about modulation here. So as you can see here, this is uh, this is how it's supposed to be properly modulated. Not. That's too much. A little bit too close. Yeah, right. give yourself some headroom. Right. How much headroom, do you ask? Well, you should... Aim to modulate, we like to say, between minus four and minus six. Mm -hmm. Give yourself, that's going to give enough strength to your signal, enough to your voice signal to make sure that it's heard properly. More importantly, that the engineer that gets it on the other end goes, Whew. you know, mm -hmm. it's good. That's, mm -hmm. I can play with this. I can manipulate this. I'm not going to, it's not going to add any extra noise. Yeah. When I bring the volume up, it's not going to really, really right. raise the noise floor much. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but if you look at something like this, <clears throat> you know, if you see the scale on the side, this is it peaking probably at about, oh, minus, it looks like about minus, minus 18 or so. Yeah. And, just barely above minus 12. Right. In there. You don't want it there. It really has to be louder. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people say, well, you just record low and normalize. Mm -hmm. You don't want to normalize because when you normalize, what happens is not only does the noise of your voice, which is not noise, it is a sweet melody, but if it, the noise of the room also gets raised when you normalize. And so if you hit the normalize button in there and go to minus three, yeah, it'll look proper. Of course, if you've got a transient in there or something like that, it's going to throw you off. It's going to throw you off a little bit. Uh, so, it if there's noise back here, it's 
in the room tone. And the room tone, that comes it's going to get too. louder. Yeah, so if your original audio was, say, peaking at minus 14, right. and you normalize to minus 3, uh, a little bit of math, blah, 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 11 dB. <laughs> it's 11 dB. So whatever the noise floor was before, it's going to go up, too. Um, yeah, I mean, it's especially for anything that's like... Um, broadcast or you know basically narration where you're not doing crazy character voices right you know you can record in, in a nice range that lands in that minus 6 db peak level and you can be in pretty good shape right and also when you're recording and and, I, and i've learned this one if you have if it's really dynamic you may not be reading the copy quite right if you're doing a conversational read it should be fairly even across the board but but if you're doing animation and video games what do we do there. What do you? Well, let me ask what you do. If you ever do auditions for that kind of stuff, oh, or? all the time. Yeah, no, it's mic technique. We're always talking about how important mic technique is because you, if you're if you're going to get louder and you don't want to play with the levels, you can back off the mic mm -hmm. and and turn away because if you're yelling or shouting or something like that, you're not yelling into somebody's ear. You're way off of somebody, and the mic will pick you up that way, and that's how you control that. And you just learn how much it is that. You know what gain is proper for when you're doing that. You plan ahead. And that and I mean, and that is a good technique to have, especially if you have a larger space, a larger studio. Where that technique can sometimes fail you is in really small spaces. Right. When you're in a whisper room or a small booth, your closet. When you back away from the mic too far, it really starts to sound boxy. It sounds like you're in a dis in, you're distant. And the reason it happens is now the distance between you and the mic, and the mic and the wall, and you and the wall. That all becomes about the same distance after a while. Right. So the mic is hearing a mix of what bounces off that, what bounces off that, and you. And that's why you get that hollow sound. Right. So if you're stuck in that situation, that's when you're going to have to probably be a little more conservative on the levels. That's right. what I find seems to help. Right. Um, so now peaking at minus 10, minus 12, it's a trade off, right? So you're going to have, you know, less, lower peaks. But you're going to have less of a, a, of a of a worry that you're going to clip, right? Um, and the thing is, when you're done all that, your your levels are going to mostly look kind of low, right? Um, with peaks that are going to jump out at you, right? But at least you're not always at the corner of your eye going, oh, did I clip that? Oh, did I clip that? You right. know that little extra headroom. Another trick I learned recently in the last not too little distant uh, past, past was that yes. 24 bit uh, recording can sometimes improve the noise floor as well. Because if you record at a really, really low level, I'm not saying you should, but if you do, if you're recording at minus 18, minus 12, with 24-bit, if normalized, it doesn't increase the hiss that can sometimes happen with 16-bit. Right. We geek out about this topic on an episode of Pro Audio Suite. Well, where the jo more your job is to geek out. Yes, we podcast. talk about it in unbelievable detail. If you want to know more, you can check that out on there. I'll find you a link to it. But the bottom line is, if you do record at 24-bit, you do have a little more leeway on the dynamic range. You can record a little bit lower and give yourself a little bit of wiggle room. So um, that is, you know, a technique that seems to be working for people. And pretty much everybody's gear now, even the lowly uh, Scarlet and the Steinberg, they're all 24-bit capable now. So a little bit bigger file size, not that big a deal. Alrighty. We got any questions coming in? No, or? nobody's given us any Good. questions. We've there's there's two everything. questions. Oh, maybe. okay. Where are the questions? Oh, oh here Audience we go. All right, Fred North, never short of a question, asks: I'm about to install a system of vibra vibration control pads, hockey pucks. I like hockey pucks. An engineer friend, engineer friend, one of my favorite phrases, and an audio expert both said. 15 to 16 pads. The engineer suggested placing them between the 2 by 4 studs. Do you concur? You like hockey pucks. Yeah, actually. Uh, Being a goalie, I liked hockey pucks. <laughs> yeah. A while ago, I don't remember where I read the reference to hockey pucks, but uh, that was deemed to be a good way to increase the isolation of a booth off the ground. And, um, you know, everything that's rubbery has an what's called an elastomer a f spring whatever they call it, spring coefficient. Right, right. So, like, if, if, it, if it's designed for, um, if it's too hard, then you, if it's hard, you need fewer of them. If it's soft, you need more of them. Right. If there's not enough, it compresses them, and they don't have spring. If there aren't enough, and they're too hard, you get the picture. You have to have the right amount of weight per the number of pucks. 
so that the thing actually has a spring to it. You ever walk up to an old car and you push on it and it goes, wah, 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 wah. and then yeah. you go up to like a big truck and you push on the bumper and it doesn't move at all? Like it just doesn't, because the springs are set up for that carrying a lot of weight. So this is a technique to try. Now, I don't know where to best put the pucks, to be honest, in his particular situation. He's saying Evenly between spaced. the two by four studs. Um, I don't know because I haven't seen the way his booth's designed. It, whatever is currently making contact with the floor, that's what the, it should be resting on. Right. Um, yeah, so I, I guess you could make it fun and float the booth so that the pucks are inside the flame uh, frame, and so they're actually standing. I don't, I'm not going to. Yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't flushed that idea out, but uh, okay. generally, the, it's gonna the frame of the booth is gonna sit on the pucks. Okay, that's the way to go. All right. If you're on a cement floor in your garage, though, who cares? Probably not, not a big nothing deal. Nothing coming through the bottom. Probably not a big deal. T Man asks, is there a way to make Audacity or anything else that will show the VU meters? But of course. Yeah. So if we can go back to Dawview there for a second, I can I can demonstrate exactly what he's asking for. All right, throw that up there. Because, yeah, Audacity has meters, but you may not see them by default. Well, that's true. Well, they're they're up top here. Let me see if I can get this into the shot here a little Sometimes bit. they're out of the shot. Sometimes. Well, hold on. I'll fix that because I know how. There, there we go. go. Yeah, don't right. move it too much. There yeah, the, the meters are up here, and it says click to start monitoring if you've got the latest one. And you'll notice there's the meter right there. It's a pretty see, good view meter, actually. It, it, it is, and it and you can see that the levels here are pretty much perfect, but peaking between minus four and minus six, with an occasional loud one as I get a little bit closer. If yours is missing, your your meter is hidden, maybe view. hidden away somewhere. Yeah, is it in the view menu? I'm not sure. I can never remember where it is in this software where they where the view meter uh, bar is if yours is hidden. But um, it it put you know yeah, I installed it. It always it, shows right up. There. Yeah, it's every right time there. I install it, it's right it's right there. So, so you should have your view meter. This ready is to your go. view meter, and it's very accurate, and it has all those numbers on mm -hmm. it. All right, we have two very patient guests waiting for to get on let's our get show right now, and let's talk about all sorts of cool stuff. So we'll be right back with Bill and Ariana Ratner right after these messages. You're watching VOBS TV. I don't know why. It's crazy what they do here. I think I'm going to go somewhere else and have a cheese sandwich. You're still watching VLBS? <laughs> VLBS? VOBS is still on? Seriously? In a world of audio, two men knew what they were doing, or at least they have you convinced. They put the BS and VOBS.TV. I'd like to tell everybody about our buddies over at Source Elements, the creators of Source Connect. I like to be on mic, too. And uh, they make a product that you guys need to have if you're ready to connect with studios for live, real-time recording sessions. The kind of stuff that really starts paying some of the bigger payouts in the voiceover business. Um, you're going to be expected to be able to connect to studios from your studio real-time so that you can be recorded at their end. And it's a beautiful thing. You connect to the studio, you read your copy, you get your direction, and when your session's done, it's done. You don't have to edit, you don't have to send files, nothing. You just you hang up and you move on to the next thing, and that's the beauty of a Source Connect type session. If you want to give it a try, you can go over to sourceelements.com, that's source-elements.com, and get a 15-day free trial of Source Connect Standard. Source Connect Standard's the tool you need, that's the one to try. You can also dabble with Source Connect now, their free tool, but the one you need to connect to studios around the world is Source Connect Standard. Go give it a try. You don't have to have an iLock dongle, and you're going to love it. It's an incredibly great tool used by so many great voice actors, including Bill Radner. He's had it for years. Well, we'll be right back here with Dan, Ariana, and Bill. 
right after this. Are you confused about how to set up and maintain a professional quality voiceover studio? No wonder. The information out there is mostly mythology. This is the best microphone to use. You have to have a preamp. You need a soundproof booth. This software is the best. Your audio must be broadcast quality. Consult with someone who knows the truth. Someone who's been there, in the trenches, doing voiceover for over 30 years. Someone with unparalleled experience with voiceover studios, who's worked with hundreds of voice actors and designed hundreds of personal studios. He knows how to teach and cares about your success in one of the harshest environments known to voiceover, your home. Dan Leonard, the home studio master. Separate myth from fact and get a handle on your personal voiceover studio. Contact the home studio master at homevoiceoverstudio.com. All right. Bill Ratner is one of the premier voices in America today. You hear him on trailers, commercials, documentaries, and animation. Watch this demo and you'll instantly recognize him. In the dark of night, a beast from the sea attacks a German U-boat. The fate of the vessel has remained a mystery. But some believe an infamous monster may be connected. This Friday, everybody in. Take your herd to Fur. Hang on. Are you seeing this too? Epic. Ferdinand, hoof it to theaters. My right. I said right. I thought you meant my right. We have the same right. Friday, rated PG. The Wild West. The action. The adventure. The grit. The guns. The glory. An untamed land. Full of untamed men. If you're flying Jackpot Airlines, you too banging in there? You must be high. Just a little captain stuff. I never get high when I'm flying. LA to Vegas. Service begins this January on Fox. You know, and we're also privileged to have his daughter Ariana, an accomplished voice talent herself, with us as well. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop, guys. Thank you, Great to be here. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure to have you here tonight. Uh, and it, it's, not, it's not often we have two people as guests here. So it looks great, doesn't it? We made it work. That's, that's the most important thing. Now, Bill, Free shot. I learned that in film school. Yeah. <laughs> the camera, we had to stick it outside, right. but it's working. Yeah. And then there was a two shot, which meant something completely different. Yeah. But, uh, anyway... You've had a very successful career, and uh, did you, I hope you didn't use the past tense. Yes, it was so nice, I, wasn't I, it? Well, I said, it was just, <laughs> uh, well, I can say had, and it still makes sense in the timeline that you are still extremely busy. Thank you, thank you. All yeah. right, well, you know, how long have you been doing this? I've been doing this since uh, I was 12 years old, <laughs> when I founded really? uh, WCLO radio station in my, uh, in, in my third floor bedroom in Minneapolis, Minnesota, named after my uh, sixth grade teacher, Bob Close. Yeah. This is WCLO. I sounded more like, <laughs> this is WCLO, or this. This is WCLO. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> That's exactly how I sounded. And, uh, yeah, no, I, no. the truth is, I was a latecomer. Uh -huh. Pardon my French. That's okay. And uh, I um, started in radio when I, when I was 30 years old. Really? And had done theater before that. Ah, okay. And then realized that I needed to make a real living, so... Uh, <laughs> so you went into radio? You went into radio, <laughs> yeah. Whoa. <Wow. laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, okay. So, uh, what led you to voiceover? I, uh, at, at this station, KKISS 99, yeah. out in Diablo country in Northern California, um, one of the sales guys said, if you're moving to L.A., Go study with the great Johnny Rabbit, the 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 late Don DiPietro, mm -hmm. and he teaches voiceovers. And I literally said, "What are voiceovers?" And he said, "You know that CBS commercial you just did fifty five tags right. for at seven o'clock at night before you you wanted to go home, right. available in San Fernando, available in Seattle, available in right, blah, blah, blah. Right, right. well, you got paid nothing, but you're one hundred and sixty five a week." And the guy who did the actual commercial, right. 
got two hundred and some dollars. I went, that's voiceover. Right. So when I got to L.A., I started doing voiceover workshops, and I didn't quit. It was a, the the time I spend do, I spent doing voiceover workshops was the time one would spend to become an attorney or a doctor, <laughs> which is, neither of which I wanted to be. Right. Well, as long as you're doing something fun. Yes. Who'd you study with? I studied with uh, Johnny Rabbit, the great Joni Gerber, all kinds of people. And uh, at some point, my agent said, stop, the guy you're studying with is an idiot. They said, no, no, he's a friend. We have a good time. <laughs> right. She said, your directors are your teachers. And um, the, the stuff that I remember from voiceovers, the greatest tips are from copywriters and creative directors who directed me. Yeah. Such as, Bill, you have a nice voice. I can see why you do voiceovers, but you're talking to me like a suburban announcer. And, and, and I would wrongly say, well, that's what I am. And my agent would say, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> and uh, I remember a woman saying from, from an ad agency in San Francisco, saying, you know, you and I were just talking a moment ago out in the hall. Talk to me that way. Just right. be yourself. Which I think is the hardest thing in the world for voiceover people to learn how to do. Yeah. You're doing everything. I mean, we just showed a small smidgen of the type of things you do. I'm a bag boy at Ralph's. Okay, I good. I wash cars. Yeah. All right. You work at Gelson's on the weekends, too? Yes, absolutely. Too. I love the cheese. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, and the great prepared foods. But yes. uh, what do you attribute your success to? I mean, you're you're doing so many things across many different genres. And, uh, you know, some people just specialize in one area. You do a lot of promo. You do the trailers. But you're doing everything else. I attribute my success to the fact that I started before Voices.com, Voice123, et cetera, et cetera. It's harder <laughs> okay. now. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you, unless you're looking right at your computer and your inbox and it comes in, you get in the booth and get it back in 15 seconds. Um, I, you, you know, lots of friends teach voiceover. Uh, I don't uh, teach commercially. I volunteer at the Don LaFontaine Voiceover Lab, which George Whittem created and designed <laughs> uh, at the Screen Actors Guild. And... Um, one of the things that I find out from people who take workshops is they brand yourself. Be, you know, make sure that people know that you're the one who does blah, blah, blah. You do funny voices or you just do promo or you do this. We're actors. We're performers. Right. And uh, we can do it all. I mean, when you really closely listen, if you go on agent, listen to agency reels. Go on CESD or Atlas Talent or, or Abrams or any of them and listen to talent's reels and go from category, go from promo to trailer to commercial to animation. Of course, animation is different. Mm -hmm. But you'll find that this is the same person, many of the same people, hundreds of us, are doing it all. It's just, it's a different voice. Trailer is, is telling a story. Promo is a little sort of overwrought. Right. Uh, the animation is, is, is done by the pros who have a million voices. And commercials are done by people who can be a real person and sound like a likable host, sell something secretly at the same time, right. and tell a story. Right. Let, let's talk about diarrhea. You know, it's, <laughs> okay. It's, we'll be right back diarrhea. with medical tips after <laughs> okay. this. It's, what's your favorite stuff to do of all the stuff that you, you spend all day doing? The, 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 the Two things. I love trailers because you have... Less than 30 seconds to tell a story that filmmakers have spent a year and a half and tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to tell. And uh, they don't want you to sound like the movie, but you need to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And I love long-form narration. And the TV wars are on, so from, from HBO to DirecTV to Discovery ID to Smithsonian Channel... Uh, Hundreds of TV documentaries are being made every year. Right. And um, I sc I'll score at least two. Um, <laughs> those are really fun. Those, you sit in your booth and you tell the story. Right. I mean, it's it, depending if it's Dead of Night on Discovery, it's, you know, you're telling Pulp Fiction. Right. If it's history, it's, it's, it's uh, history. If it's Sex, Dogs, and Rock and Roll. Excuse me, I've got to take a call. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, it, it, narration is a lot of fun. Long-form narration is fun because you're really telling a story. Right. And uh, not everyone, not all Americans are great readers for reasons we can pin on Betsy DeVos. Well, that's true. Well, we were, yeah. we were looking at that that at your, your demo reel there, and you were just, just that one little thing for the thing on the Loch Ness Monster. Now, that was just a promo, but you were telling the story all the way through it, and it just... 
draws you right in. Actually, that was part of the show. Yeah. Um, oh, the okay. first the first part of almost every uh, narration that you hear on Discovery ID is amped up a little bit. Right. And I put that in there and then put part of the show in there, which is a little more key storytelling. But that's the fun stuff. Yeah. What's the weirdest thing you've ever done? I did two syllables voice for the acting. great late <laughs> Don, Don, Don LaFontaine. Keep it to voice acting. And uh, uh, he had come into KCBS Channel 2 in L.A. and did something like, Tonight, cops from the LAPD. It's a tough job. You know, 30-second promo, a series yeah. of promos for a whole special mini-doc. And uh, I was in there doing something else, and he had gone on to another gig and was not available that day, but they needed a Tonight tag they had forgotten to get. So I got in the booth and put myself in about eight different audio positions <laughs> to, to sound like Don LaFontaine, the great late Don LaFontaine. Right. right. Tonight, tonight, tonight. And when the spot actually aired, it was the LAPD cops. Da, 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 da. Tonight. <laughs> that was me. That was the weirdest job. But I did get paid. God bless the union. Yes, that's good, good for them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don had a great voice, though. I mean, it's just like you. It doesn't take a whole lot technically. It's you. Well, the difference between Don LaFontaine and, and every other male voiceover in the world is that all, all the rest of us wanted to do voiceovers right. as kids. And he just sort of fell into it. He yeah. was a, a producer, a trailer producer. Right. And he produced uh, for Paramount, then later Kaleidoscope in Hollywood, and was in his mid to late 40s when he was chased around, literally, by Steve Tisherman, the, uh, the agent. And it took Tisherman two years to seduce him into doing voiceovers. <laughs> so, I don't know, man. Let those guys, let actors do that stuff. I produce. He's making a good living. Right. And suddenly, uh, he started getting hired to do kung fu movies and all kinds of wild <laughs> stuff and thought, yeah, I don't go. go. Yeah, sure, let's do a few more of those. <laughs> <laughs> and, mm -hmm. the, and the pay was good. Yes. Now, we have your daughter Ariana with us tonight. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And, and you're doing voiceover now, too. I am, yeah. So, I mean, and is this like something that you, like, you were destined to do? Or it's like, I want to be like Dad? Or what, what drew you to it? I mean, I've been acting since I was probably three. I think okay. when I was little, I, would, I had long red curly hair, which I have now. But And people on the street would tell me I should be in commercials. And so I begged my, my parents were not stage parents at all. But I begged them to put me in commercials. No, and... God, no, honey, you're not going to do that stuff. Yeah, and so I started acting when I was like three, and I always just wanted to be an actor, I think, my whole life. And so I went to an arts high school for acting. I went to um, NYU to Tisch for acting. Um, and voiceovers I also always did. I think I did like a Mattel commercial when I was seven or something. But and then I had a series, a straight-to-DVD animated series when I was 18 for like six seasons that I did. Um, but it was always an addition to on camera. And then I moved back to LA nine years ago, um, and started auditioning on camera and voiceover. And I kind of just came to a point where I was like, I just don't like on camera. And I, and I kind of focused more on voiceover. And so I've been doing that ever since. Yeah. She was always a great mimic. I mean, she mm -hmm. would stand outside by studio going nye, 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 tonight at six o'clock. And was funnier and better than I was. And I, and I, so I thought, I've got to keep her out of the business because I'll lose work. Right. But I also, and, every night, like, or in the morning when I was waking up, I'd hear, because his studio was right under my floor. Oh, on your floor. And it would be, like, on my elliptical machine that was in my room for some reason, and he'd be like, stop it, I'm recording. Honey, stop, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You guys really lived in a world. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is my life. That's the thing I was thinking when you guys Besides were coming Besides sleeping on his couch, yes. Oh, okay, <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah. Uh, the fact, the reason you're here is because your dad has written a book about parenting in the digital age. I just happen to is. have a copy of Parenting for the Digital Age, and I interviewed Ariana and her buddies. We had a babysitting co-op for years. Mm -hmm. We babysat kids including our own, from age two and a half to 15. Right. And uh, so I called all the parents and I called all the kids and I heard different stories from each as to what did you do for your children to keep them uh, off uh, the tube and the internet 18 hours a day. And um, we had a situation with, uh, with Ariana when she was three. 
she was watching TV and she knew better how to use the remote than I did. I was also only allowed to watch Pee Wee Herman, <laughs> maybe Gumby and Pokey. I think that's it. I wasn't allowed to watch TV. My sister was allowed to watch anything she wanted because she came later, but I was not allowed to watch TV. <laughs> so, so we had to figure Gumby. out a way, how do we control <laughs> without getting the blowback of my child screaming hysterically at me, I hate you, you're a horrible parent. So I had a switch. I hired an electrician friend put a switch in the basement, one single on-off switch, which de-electrified the entire home electronics center. Yeah. The VCR, the TV, and so at age three, she knew better how to, she could, could go in by herself, put in VHSs on and on and on, and uh, so I thought, this has got to end. But I'm too scared to say no, <laughs> so I would just go down, going downstairs for a sec, like kids, <laughs> Turn the thing off, and she would say, Daddy, the TV's not working! <laughs> Gosh, this sounds so familiar. We did the same thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we, we had it on a computer. The computer would shut off at 7.30. Brilliant. And he figured out how to, yeah. <laughs> how to yeah. hack through it. Yeah. And he was only like six or seven. So. No, I really had a good time. This was a fun... I, I uh, went to a storytelling conference, told a story, taught a workshop called Voiceovers for Storytellers. And a woman said, have you ever thought about writing a book about your volunteer work with kids and media? And I said, no, what are you with the FBI? And she said, no, my husband and I just started a publishing company called Familia's Books. And uh, so I sent him a chapter and an outline, and they said, great, go ahead, send me a contract. I started writing. I had no idea how to write past 50 pages. Mm. Books are generally longer than that. Right. And so I went and enrolled at UC Riverside in a low-residency MFA program just to figure out to learn how to finish the book. Hmm. And in the meantime, it's been an incredible adventure talking to psychologists and media experts and kids. And I got confronted at CBS uh, uh, doing a promo by a young guy who handed me the copy. He said, um, yeah, here's a copy for the show. Aren't you the guy who doesn't let your kids watch TV? <laughs> and, and I sort of gulped and he said, this is interesting because we pay you to tell people to watch television and yet you don't. And I came up with, oh, wow. yeah. oh, I have two jobs. I'm a father and a professional announcer. Zinga. And so that's sort of the, 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 the core of this wonderful book, Parenting for the Digital Age, the truth behind media's effect on children and what to do about it. And if you don't, well, I don't blame you unless you're a parent or a teacher or an educator or an astronaut. Oh, you need this yeah. Do you think people went up to Steve Jobs and said, hey, Steve, uh, why don't you let your kids use iPads? There is an interesting anybody... Steve Jobs story, thank you very much, George Whittem. Um, soon before his death, a New York Times uh, writer was going to do a profile on him. In his home, he said, you have three kids. They must be the most amazing environment in the world with all these electronics. And he said, uh, they don't have any. We don't allow them. I know what they'll do to my kids. And it completely changed this guy's point of view. He went from home to home and office to office and CFOs and CEOs in Silicon Valley. They all said the same thing. Interesting. And these are the ones who make it. They, it's, the, the stuff is designed, you know, from the iPhone to whatever, uh, to software is designed to be addictive, especially yeah. for children. Oh, absolutely. I'm not addicted at all. Uh, yeah. Hold on just a second. You guys have been on your phones. That's so nonstop. Yeah, I've been posting about this show. Uh, Hashtagging. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're doing your job. Yeah, yeah, right right yeah. now, you guys are doing your job. Right. That is promoting yeah. us and you, and that's what you're supposed to do. Exactly. Right. Dan but Letter. Turning it George off. George Widow. <laughs> Susan and Jack you. Daniel together again for the first time. <laughs> Can't wait to have you do some drops for us. That would be great. Absolutely. All righty. If you're just joining us, we're talking with Bill and Ariana Ratner. We're talking about their careers in voiceover, which are very successful, and about Bill's book, uh, Parenting in the Digital Age. If you have a question for Mr. Ratner or Ms. Ratner, all you have to do is put it in the chat room or on our Facebook page, and Jack Daniel will get it to us, and we will ask it to him in the next segment. All righty. So what's been the response other than this one guy at CBS who's like, hey, you're the guy that wrote that. Have you been, has it been selling and people have been... I, I, I went around New York Book Expo with uh, the publisher mm -hmm. and I said, be honest with me. Dude, how's this doing? And he said, I'd consider it a moderate success. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he was a Mormon. Mormons don't lie. Right, right, right. right. And uh, I thought, okay. 
Um, have I made my money back? I hired publicists. I thought, you know, this is, I was kind of a personal mission. And would I have made much money off this? No. I mean, I got into Time Magazine and, and uh, a bunch of talk shows and so on, but books are a hard sell these days. Yeah. I mean, a friend of mine asked somebody at the LA Times, uh, he did a Shakespearean quote, and the guy said, what are you talking about? He goes, that's from Shakespeare, don't you read? He goes, yeah, I read. I read manuals. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> exactly. So... Uh, have you done an audio book of it? I there is an audio book. I would apparently. I would imagine if you didn't do it, it would be a total shock if you didn't it do was, that. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was fun to tell the story. Yeah, I had to slow myself down. I had no director, but I did it and edited it, and it's on. Did you have memory. Ariana voice some of the things that are? I should have. It would have been much better. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought of it a little late, but you know, because <laughs> because you add a lot to it because you're the actual voice of what that was all about. Yeah, it's really cool. So. Being at th this woman, like I, uh -huh. uh, is a child of, of a media person. My dad was an advertising guy. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was very, very lucky. I had a bird's eye view. Uh, you know, he would take me to, to work on Saturday and there'd be voiceover guys and TV personalities and, and fiddle players, you know, doing jingles and all kinds of folks. And uh, so Ariana, I'm, I'm curious as to what, so many people grow up, you know, their dad's a real estate salesman or, you know, or their mom is, you know, whatever, school teacher or philosopher or astronaut. What was it like growing up inside a media family? Is that an advantage <laughs> or a curse? I mean, it was definitely an advantage. It definitely has helped me. I've had many people say, wait, are you related to Bill Ratner? I mean, a lot of when I was doing on camera, it was Brett Ratner, which I was like, <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it's helped a lot. And also... I mean, it was just interesting. It's a much more interesting career that no one until recently knew about voiceovers. They didn't know what it was my dad did. Um, and I didn't really, sometimes I don't know the scope. It's like he's famous in this like really niche world that <laughs> most people don't know about. <laughs> but then you meet people in voiceover and they're like, oh yeah, I know your dad. Either they heard of him or they you know, met him like, or 30 years him. ago. Yeah, or like, of course. Yeah, I mean, I met someone who does voiceovers and we became friends on Instagram and he messaged me and he was like, by the way, is your dad Bill Ratner? And I was like, yeah. I thought he was going to say, oh, like, he's amazing. I, you know, and he was like, I met him at a storytelling conference, uh, like a storytelling convention two years ago in Wisconsin. And I used to, I went there specifically because I worshipped him when I was little because I watched G.I. Joe. <laughs> And it was this uh -huh. whole story, and I was like, this is amazing. I sent it to him. I was like, this is amazing. Like, this random guy, I thought he was going to be like, oh, yeah, your dad's, like, but he, you know, he traveled to, and it was the storytelling, like, aspect, See, which he likes. This is the part of it I love. This makes me feel very good. <laughs> oh, yeah. There is a dark side. And the dark side that, you know, is, is she's been coming to me for years saying, I've got this audition. Would you help me with it? And uh, because she's family, I figure, well, I can say anything. Right. So my direction will sound like, you're sounding too Valley Girl. Don't do it. Or line reads. Yeah, or line, line reads. Read. Don't do it like that. Do it like it's a safe way. And she'll say, don't line read, please. And I'll say, but that's what they do. And well, then she'll say, no, they don't. And so, uh, and, 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 and because I feel I have the freedom to talk to my, she's my daughter. She's right. not, I'm not a friend I'm directing. I can just be, you know, the horrible, you know, ugly old man that I actually am. But and, it's helped. I mean, I, he was in Europe this past summer, and I had an audition for an HGTV narrator narration, and I was like, "This is huge, and it's what I really want." And I called him. I think it was like eleven. It was eleven p.m. my time, and I guess you'd just woken up, and you were like helping me over the phone, and I was just that was a that was a mess. <laughs> but like uh, you know, he helped me edited it and took the, the parts of it that sounded good and helped me, which doesn't happen that often. Like, but it really you know. It really helps. It's, Good. It's, yeah. The yeah. interesting wow. uh, part, because, it, you know, it's an intimate relationship, father-daughter, and, and, you know, we know each other very well, and it brings to mind so many things, stuff that you guys were talking about earlier, on a, on a deep uh, sort of intuitive level. If I am trying to get a read out of her and, and either can't or I have to say it right or I have to be nicer or chill out, um, what is it I'm trying to get? What is it that I that I either love about the read or don't? And uh, it, it addresses questions that you guys were talking about, you know, repeatedly at the beginning of the show. Well, mm -hmm. it's so, also so interesting because, like, I went to acting school. I went to eight years of acting school. And I, you know, I know 
to know who I am, who I'm talking to, where I am, moment before that stuff. But you forget, like, you're like, oh, and then I'll, I have these, I'm in um, Bob Bergen's class right now, and I, he really pushes that. And he also pushes mic technique, too. Mm-hmm. So that also resonated with me. But also it's like, I had this light bulb moment recently where I was like, right, everything is acting. It's all acting. It's all who you are and who you're talking to and where you are. Like, it's situational, and every single piece of copy now, I approach that way, and it's, I mean, I should always be doing that, but, like, you know, you have to remind yourself it's acting. And it's very hard, because in the context of being in an acting class and a little black box theater, and there's a director and your friends, you're sort of used to it, you've been to plays, you know the gig, and the gig is you have a scene where you're trying to convince your father to love you or whatever it is, but voiceovers... Is, is, I think, in its own strange way, harder and much more removed from any context. You're in something that resembles a phone booth with a lot of glass, and yet there's no outside, and you have a piece of copy written that looks like English, but it's really nothing that any (laughs) normal human being would ever say. Yeah, exactly. And yet you have to sound as real, as likable as possible, and you have to tell the story, and like I said earlier you're secretly selling a product or a right. service or a broadcast yeah. entity or a movie or yeah. something. Or overtly doing it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting. Once again, we're talking with Bill and Ariana Ratner about voiceover and parenting and voiceover and parenting and all sorts of stuff like that. And we've got lots of questions from you. And again, if you have a question, throw it in the chat room and we'll get right to it. And I want to talk a little bit about storytelling, too, which we'll talk about in the next segment. So stay tuned. We'll be right back here on VoiceOver Body Shop. Skittles, taste the rainbow. She has fought for those who don't have a voice. The National Zoo. (laughs) Because sometimes you just need to stroke a llama. Instagram. Download it and start embarrassing your teenagers today. Resolve spot and stain. Because the dog's gonna drag his butt on the carpet. He just is. $400 million. That's what the mayor wants you to pay for a new basketball stadium. Chickens were made to be fried. Sorry, buddy. KFC. Engage the droid army with this Lego Star Wars Republic fighter tank. (laughs) What? You've never seen a girl kill a troll? GameStop. Hey, I'm the cat meme guy. Come on, you know you love cat memes. Instagram, what's your thing? Hi, it's J. Michael Collins, and these are just a few examples of the first-class demos my team and I are producing. If you'd like to have something similar, visit jmcvoiceover.com and click on the Demo Production tab to find out more. All right, one of our sponsors is not just one of our sponsors. He's the guy that's been our sponsor since day one here on VoiceOver Body Shop, Uh, and that's Harlan Hogan and his great website, voiceoveressentials.com voiceoveressentials.com why should you go there because he has anything you could possibly need for a home voiceover studio or if you're on the road or any of these things he's got lots of tools and tips and all sorts of really cool things that you could just go on the website look at the stuff that's there look at the great prices that he has and the great guarantees that he has if you don't like it you can send it back you know, and I think he personally does it. Oh, this is he puts it in the back and sends it back. Hardly ever does it because everybody loves his stuff. One of the great things about his website is the Harlan Hogan Signature Series products that he has, like the VO1A microphone, which is in front of Mr. Whittem right now. I can pan the shot to the there. Microphone. There we go. Just don't lose the focus. There it is, the VO1A right there that we use here on Voiceover Body Shop, and also the Harlan Hogan Signature Series headphones, which Mister Woodham will now model for you. Just give it the. Uh, there they are. They're wonderful. They are comfortable. They're made of memory foam, leather, metal. They're Quick, made we, of metal. Actually, uh, Ariana, will you come over for a second? Okay, I, just just come right over here. All right. I need her hand. Oh, okay. Because she's, go. she's got she's nail got great polish. Hands. Right. So just do that hand. There we go. There we go. Oh, oh, that works much better. <laughs> I think we just sold 10 pair just doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, they're comfortable. But most importantly, they are designed specifically for voiceover. All the stuff that we use is primarily designed for making music. We've just adopted it. Well, Harlan has taken this idea of a flat response headphone 
that only reveals what your voice actually sounds like without any coloring that you usually get putting on headphones and lowering your, your voice half an octave. But they are designed for voiceover. They are voiceover optimized, and you can get them over at voiceoveressentials.com. And it's real easy to get there to check them out. All you have to do is go to the bottom of our homepage and click on the little icon of Harlan Hogan talking into his Portabooth Pro, and it will take you right there, and you can clear out his shelves for him. It would He would be just thrilled by every pair of headphones, microphones, and all the other great stuff he has there, books, and access to just about every piece of equipment you want through, through Amazon. So go over to voiceoveressentials.com. You will not regret it, and we won't regret it if you go over there either. So thanks for being our sponsor for... Almost eight years, Harlan. We really appreciate it. We'll be right back. Minus four, are we at minus four dB? We're at minus four dB on VLBS. All right, we're back with Bill and Ariana Ratner. Great modeling there, by the way. That was that was outstanding. Thanks for playing along. <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the things that you do is you're a storyteller. You've won the, the Moth Slam a, a number of times. That's one of my favorite programs on NPR is listening to the Moth. I want to be on that so bad because I got some great stories. But it's not about the stories. It's how you tell them. What What is the essence of being a great storyteller? The Moth is really interesting. I mean, it started out uh, in George Dawes Green, kind of a mid-list thriller writer, and his uh, studio in New York in the 90s where he got tired of these literary parties and uh, said, you know what, I'm going to invite my friends, but on the invitation he said, you have to tell a five-minute personal story without notes on this particular theme. I don't know what it was, family or cars or hair or whatever it was. And if you really don't want it, you can come, but I urge you to do. And so, you know, 40, 50 people showed up, most of them with stories. They spent the evening after a little cheese and wine listening to stories. And uh, as people left, they said, this is the greatest party we've ever been to in our lives. You've got to do this. And he took it seriously and probably went to the New Yorican Poets Cafe or someplace in New York that said, yeah, you can do this on Tuesday nights once a month. And now The Moth, as in themoth.org, The Moth Story Hour is the radio show. The Moth live competitions are all over the country. There are three in L.A., five in New York. They're in Ann Arbor, Minneapolis, Portland, San Francisco, etc. And you can, you can go on themoth.org look up schedule, find your town, go to the venue, which is probably a rock and roll club or a bar that that gives itself over to storytelling once a month, right? and put your name in the hat. I would prepare the story in advance, but you, you learn the themes, I think, three or four weeks in advance. Right. And it's a really fun exercise to just get up on stage with your own thoughts and tell a story. And uh, some are sad, some are happy, some are wacky. And um, I got hooked on it. Um, I'm you know, sure you I, did. I did a little crazy, you know, improv and stand up when I was a small child, and th thank goodness I left that behind. And the world, I think, is a happier place for it. <laughs> uh, but uh, storytelling, you know, there there are a number of scenes. There's traditional storytelling, a lot of Southern storytellers who tell old Jack tales from the Appalachians, and personal storytelling is a huge thing. Came out of acting classes in the mm -hmm. '80s, mm -hmm. where Peggy Fury, famous Hollywood celebrity acting coach, said. You know, class, I'm sick and tired of your scene work. Next month you're going to come and you're going to tell personal stories. I don't care what it is. And half the class said, I don't want to do this. The other half said, let's go let's for go it. Go for it, yeah. And uh, so, you know, she began to create a generation of people who could sort of tell from the heart. And uh, I, I still do it. I mean, they're, they're, you, you can Google personal storytelling in whatever city you're in, San Francisco, L.A., Austin, and find a venue and hang out and yeah. go, I could do that. Yeah. But also he's been, I mean, when I was little, he would read me and my friends to sleep. Like, of course. And he would tell these stories. Like, he was an amazing story. To, obviously, he has yeah. that voice. But, and then he would tell stories around the campfire at our summer camp that he also, like, would go to. Yeah. <laughs> work at. Yeah. This, that's yeah. A, it's got to be, it's a primal skill, I think, that many humans have. Because before we had TV and radio and smoke signals, we had storytelling. Yeah. Around also, the voiceover guys really love to hear their own voices. If there's not a <laughs> microphone there, around, there is it's that. a yes. good excuse. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Hey, we've got lots of questions from our amazing audience that is vast and all across this planet. 
And uh, let's go to the first question we have. It's from Jack Daniel. Yeah, it's actually... You, you get the first question because you control I'd the chat room. room. But he doesn't so, have a mic. He does not He does not have a mic. So, yeah. All right. So Jack asks, Bill, you have such a terrific signature sound. Do you know when you realized you had one? Gee whiz. Um, I, <laughs> I, I was, it was, it was late in the game. Um, I didn't really think about it in the theater. I did theater for years in Minneapolis and Berkeley and San Francisco. And uh, it wasn't until I started taking a voiceover class in L.A. at age 31 when uh, the teacher, Johnny Rabbit, said, How do you, uh, you, I see you're doing this thing. You turn your, your yeah, this is weird. I'm going to learn. I'm going to do that, too. <laughs> and and uh, when I started listening to other voiceover people, listening to their demo tapes, and then paying more attention, paying attention to TV commercial breaks in that weird way that we do, where we put our hand to our ear and we go, why did I sound like Scott Rummel? You know, <laughs> um, who does every trailer on promo in the world? Um, so I think it was late. I think it was not until I got into the industry. I was not one of those kids whose voice changed early. And uh, I'm sorry, Miss Dewey, I can't sing that song. My voice is changing. <laughs> I may be 12, but I sound 18. I wasn't that kid. So to answer your question, it wasn't until I started, you know, taking workshops and trying to compete in the world of voiceovers that I began to assess the way I sounded. And I try still to this day try to see it as as it's an objective product that I happen to have to sell. And I better damn well uh, uh, dress it up and make it work properly. Otherwise, it ain't worth much. Yeah. Well, Jack gets to ask another one. Because he's here, and we're not going to not read it. Okay. So, no, this one's for Ariana, actually, so this is very important. Now that you're making headway into both promo and animation, do you find that each genre influences your work in the other? And if so, how? So what I mostly find that I do is are video games, and I think that's probably because I have a lot of theatrical training, and I think video games is very much stage acting. It's film acting, actually. And it's so filmic and small, and but real and emotional and guttural. Like I do a lot of like, like killing and dying and you know, orcs and demon hunters and you know those kind of things. And so I also so I love doing that because it get I get to do my my Shakespearean training kind of. And then I also I love promo because it's just kind of it's just fun and it's almost like lighthearted in a way like it's like not easy it's very hard but it's like I think maybe because I've been hearing it my whole life it is a little it comes a little bit easier for me um but and affiliate work also I do a, a tv station KSBW ABC in the central coast every week and um that's what I grew up hearing him do like he does a bunch of tv stations and that also is like this whole it's like a different genre it's it's a bigger, I'm allowed to be like more bombastic in a way. Like it's, you know, the, for the for the um, community calendar kind of things that I do, they want it over the top. Like they want it like the 26th annual Big Sur International Marathon, blah, blah, blah. You know, like they want it like that. So that mm -hmm. I get to play that out. So I don't know. I think it's like these different parts of my acting training and my personality that I get to like play out in these things. And I love animation and I want to do more of it. And in my auditions that I do for it right now, I've done two animated series, but I'd like to do more. Um, then I get to be like big and fun and really act and play and like, you know, just like be a kid again. Cause it really is just play and it's just, yeah, it's just fun. So, yeah. <laughs> I think she's really good at promo and I uh, had a conversation with a great Bo Weaver who um, got the job at the time on Channel 4 in L.A. as the voice. And I was on Channel 7, and he called me up to share the news, and he said, you know, I listen to you on Channel 7, and you sound really great, Bill. And I said, you know, I do, Bo, you're absolutely <laughs> right. And uh, I, I said, it's because within 15 seconds, and this is for all the promo announcers out there, uh, within 15 seconds, I can be r ragingly indignant, uh, hysterically sad, gossipy, 
and then just purely purely informational. Mm. And that's what promo is. Promo particularly causes you, asks you, demands that you be all those things within a very short period of time. Yeah. And uh, when when I first heard Ariana do uh, her stuff for the ABC of North, I thought she's got it. She's she's got it. She can turn on a dime. And it's it's very unnatural. We don't. I mean, unless people are imitating announcers when they're talking, right? To be able for people who are interested in promo, you need to be able to turn on a dime. From I'm angry about this, and the river was dark. Why did this corporation? And then, <laughs> ball gowns from the academy plus murder on Sunday. But it's also, just, <laughs> it is like affiliate work is that old promo style that you've been hearing for oh, years. Yeah. That I grew up hearing. I mean, I grew up in the '90s, so it's like. That was what I heard, and it's very different from the style currently in terms of commercial and other voiceover work. But affiliate work is still that same announcer sound that I grew up hearing you do. And cable work. And cable work. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it you still have to have the meaning and the acting behind it. That's, like, no question. But, yeah, it is that sound that I, I've been... you. You know, you do so well, so I've been hearing it. And I, I think that we've, we've, we've heard it all before. I mean, from the time of in utero at age five, months are capable of hearing between, you know, mommy's tummy sort of amplifies. So we've been hearing television and radio and media uh, uh, ever since we were infants. Right. And uh, to be able to, I think our job is to answer the question, how should this character sound? How does this guy sound? How does this woman supposed to sound when she's talking about MTV and gossiping about Elizabeth Taylor or whoever? Um, how are you supposed to sound? And all those sounds we've heard, you know, in the nearly, you know, over a hundred years of American broadcast, um, it, the question is just pulling it up, just hearing it in your head and sort of intuitively diving in and let yourself sound silly and go for it. Mm -hmm. All righty. Uh, Professor Larry Hudson has a question. <laughs> he asks, are you going to do your one man show in L.A. sometime in the future? Bill, I believe that. Goodness more. gracious. Um, Larry, thank you. Hello. I, 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 uh, Larry and I appeared at the Transformers and G.I. Joe movies at the Egyptian. Um, the answer is I'm not sure. I did a show about my Uncle Bobby, who was Bobby the Bellboy on I Love Lucy, the Robert Jellison, um, who was a fascinating kind of tragic character and uh, had a great time in the Hollywood fringe and did it a bunch of places. Um, if I do another one man show, it's going to be about my mother-in-law called killer art. <laughs> <laughs> and she was, she taught uh, art in women's prisons, uh, Ariana's grandmother in, in the state of New York, <laughs> literally. Wow. And I would say in the house, I said, Sophie, what that thing over your mirror? What is that? Oh, she was a wonderful artist. She shot her husband <laughs> and, uh, but she's so talented. She took my class for weeks. So that that Larry, that may be my next show. I hope you're interested. It's amazing. I can't wait to see wow. that one. Yeah. That's out there. Wow. Your next question? Um, yeah, I just want to know what uh, Ariana. What do you have in your studio? Because I know it's in Bill's. What's in your studio? So my studio is in my walk-in-ish closet. Um, my boyfriend has kind of we cut out like a shelf area, and I have soundproofing, like eggshell. Um, and then I like just set my, I have a little Gefell microphone, which is an amazing, it's like the tiniest microphone that we got for my 30th birthday. Woo! Um. M930 or? Yeah. M like MH930. That. Yeah. 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 M930. Um, so, and it's awesome. It's the smallest mic. And we were, when we were buying it, he was like, this is one of the most powerful mics, but no men will buy it because it's this small. <laughs> but mm -hmm. <laughs> he literally. That's so great. Um, and I was like, I'll take it. So you don't want that, honey. You want the great. Yeah. yeah. So no, I love it. I travel with it. I, I did a. I was in Michigan a few months ago, and I did a A and E promo from my my boyfriend's family's closet, um, with that mic and my laptop and against their clothing. And so, yeah, I have that. I use Twisted Wave. Um, I have an Apogee One that I connect everything into, and it works well. I mean, I do broadcast quality sound from my closet. I mean, also, uh, I use the Shure uh, iPhone mic, Shure MV18 or something like that. I, yeah. MVI? Um, MVI. I, MVI, Is yeah. that it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I use that in my car. I keep that in my car. It's about this big. Um, and that 
it is incredible. It literally connects into your iPhone and you, I've recorded things that have one job that was bought directly from audition and they put it in, it was a, a video game um, trailer that I, when I listen to it, I can hear the quality, but like, apparently it was they fun. Don't care. Yeah. They, they don't care. They don't care. So yeah, I, that's, that's the future of voiceover too. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Thanks. It's, yeah. It's good to know that because, you know, I, I do them in the car too. It's a great, pla- actually a great place to record. It is. Yes. You know, and, and, and with equipment like that, that yeah. allows you to do it. Brent Allen Hagel. There's a name I'm not familiar with. Which is weird. I've heard uh, that one. Okay, well, as long as you've heard it, uh, can you both give some advice on how to get actors to stop reading copy and start acting copy? I know that's a, Keep it's it about short. an hour long uh, subject, yeah. but thirty second version. <laughs> <laughs> My theory is that every one of us has a default read that we do on the first read through, a uh, cold read of a piece of copy. My default read is a mid-70s suburban vanilla announcer (laughs) where everything sounds really nice. It's community calendar. And uh, that doesn't work for much these days. Right. And um, so it's it's really up to you. I mean, you really have to hear yourself. I still, to this day, when I do two, three takes on an audition in my studio by myself, the first take is just dead meat. It really is. And I don't think that as I'm doing it. I think it sounds wonderful. (laughs) <laughs> and then I'll listen back to it and I'll, and I'll hear just a complete lack of, of acting, of energy, of thought. Mm-hmm. Mm. And, and I'll sort of know that intuitively on the second read and try to put more in the third read, maybe even better. And then I, I may go back to the first read and cobble a couple of pieces when I'm editing. But um, it's, it's hard. And the hardest thing about voiceovers is that we don't get the time that uh, theatrical actors do. Actors take acting class, they just do scene work, whether they're rehearsing lines with a friend or by themselves, you know, sitting in their bathroom, they're working. Voiceover people, unless they're in a workout group uh, and they're not paying for it and they're with friends, they do it hours a week, they're only doing it during class or during auditions. And it makes it hard. It makes it hard to get voiceovers into your head and to begin to hear yourself. So uh, the other thing I would say to answer the question is, Listen to Working Voiceovers demos online, and you, you, everybody's seen Keith Richards, you know, of uh, uh, the Stones. Oh, I used to, you know, I used to listen to the Chuck Berry, and you know, I used to do every single riff, do ding ding ding, over and over until the record broke. I do the same thing, you know, when Scott Rummel or Ashton Smith get a, a trailer that I auditioned for, and I didn't get the gig, I will go on their websites or go on their agents' site and listen to their. And, you know, when, when one of them's going, in a world when time stopped and little green men, I'll do, in a world when time stopped and little green men. Because I want to get that theatrical read into the quiver of my arrows. I, I don't want to do them. I don't want to, you know, imitate them. But I want to get vocal tricks in my head. To this day, I still do that. And, and what do whatever you can do. It's an intuitive act. It's not a, voiceovers are not, a, a, doing a voiceover is not a conscious act. It's giving it up to the voiceover gods and goddesses and just going for it and reading. And then reading again and reading again and listening to yourself and realizing this is smoke and mirrors. All I'm listening for is something that makes sense. Right. But I think, I think one of the most important things is practicing cold reading because cold reading is so prevalent in voiceovers. Like I get to a video game session and I have 40 pages that I got that second with name like I do the Elder Scrolls video game and I've been doing it for like four years and every session I don't get the script before you get it there and there's names like Tagarin Lalabaden and I have to and they're like okay we want British she's kind of upper class blah 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 you know like or she's whatever they, they give me different accents and stuff but it's like it's completely cold red and you need to practice that like practice pick up a magazine and read the magazine out loud like read an article out loud to yourself, you need to be able to just pick up a piece of copy and have it come out of your mouth with no garbled words. And that's like, I think that's a really, really important part of it. And just, yeah, focusing on being able to, being able to do that and just have the words make sense. So you're thinking about what you're saying as you say it and being able to cold read. I think that's the most important part. Yeah. And voiceover yeah. people, uh, as I said, have a much harder time than, than folks who are in the theater or film or television. Mm-hmm. Because theater, film, or television, you gotta learn your lines, but you just show up. You show up. 
and you're told what to do, where to go, and how to interpret. And, you know, of course, you can be as creative as you can be. But voiceovers, we don't have that much time. We don't have that, uh, yeah. that, the, we don't have that many opportunities. But that's the other, sorry, the no. other thing I think is doing your work before you even get to the booth. Or if you do your work in the yeah. booth, that's one thing. But with animation or video games or even promo or other kind of copy, I sit down before, I break it down. You know, I if it's a scene, who am I, where, where am I, who am I talking to? I still do like acting things like my actions. If I need, if I'm like, I can't differentiate these, like I can't figure out why, how this line can sound different than this line. I'll find a different action for each one or, you know, a, an objective for the whole scene or the whole story. And I think that work that you do before, which is an actor's work, which if you go to any acting class, you should be learning, is very important and will make it so when you come to the microphone and you can you can just say it and you know what you're saying and you mean what you say and you, you have some meaning behind all of it. And geek out. <laughs> geek, geek out like a 12-year-old. Go on every voiceover site you can, listen to every demo you can. And it's like the old Foley machines. Uh, George, tell me if, the, if this is true. The old um, Foley machines where the laugher would come in to do post work on a television show, <laughs> a sitcom, and, and play. It looked like a keyboard, but there were various kinds of laughs and intensities of laughs. I never got to see one, but I heard that these it, things had like tape, uh, tape loops or something they were in literally there. They tape could trigger loops. them. And... Right, and they looked like a, sort of a, mi a miniature, you know, Wur Wurlitzer organ, but port a portable. And um, there are millions of tape loops in our heads, mm -hmm. but we have to, you have to create the geeky opportunity, usually by yourself, um, with your computer at night when someone either someone's listening to you or not, or with your friends in a work, voice of a workshop uh, uh, or workout group. Go on Facebook and look for a workout group where you don't have to pay and just get together and geek out. Yeah. That was not 30 seconds each. No, no, it, wasn't. <laughs> it really wasn't. Well, just like it's October 1st, time has flown. <laughs> and uh, we're, we're out of time, but boy, that's, that's an awful lot of knowledge thrown out in a very short period of time. We really appreciate it. Once this again. Fun, guys. Yeah, I know. George Whittem is my hero. <laughs> Helped build my studio, make me the man I am today. Mm -hmm. And now I see the man behind the man. This is just thrilling for me <laughs> it's amazing once again well you're, the book is parenting for the digital age the truth about media's effect on children and what to do about it and it's available where barnes and noble amazon wherever books are sold and it'll be available on audible probably or yeah yes it is okay yeah. excellent yeah. you could listen to bill do that one and ariana thank you so much for being with thank us you for delightful having, me. having you on yeah, the show tonight so fun. all right well george and i will be right back to say goodbye right after this thanks Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. Now there's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is voiceoverextra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. Voiceover Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, casting, home studio setup and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports and get 14 bonus reports on how to ace the voiceover audition. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. Um... And we are back. Boy, that was an amazing hour. That was a blast. That's uh, great to hear all that great stuff about what he's done, what Ariana's doing, the book, all that. Got to thank him again. Thanks for being with us, guys. It was thank great. You, yeah. Fabulous. Next week on this very show, Melissa Motes will be joining us from, from Vegas, baby. All right. Yeah. And uh, she'll talk about their st the studio she has with her husband and all the classes they teach there. The voice Actors Studio. Yes. On 1015, which is a Monday, October 15th, George and I will be in New York at Uncle Roy's Barbecue. 
<laughs> and Sue's going to be off on on something else yeah. too. So we're like, like we're, okay, we're, we're going dark that night. That's yeah. just simply not going to work. Three of us doing the show remotely. That's where we yeah. draw the it's line. Like, it's like, yeah, boy, that would <laughs> just blow the internet right out. Yeah. Uh, on ten twenty two on October twenty second, very special. We're going to have a real tech night. It's going to be Durin Gleaves from Adobe. That's great. We've He's been... one of the developers of Adobe Audition. I've seen him at trade shows. Yeah, Obviously, he knows his stuff. We've been trying to get him for quite a long time. We're really That's really cool. Right. Very cool. Yes. And on October 29th, uh, we're going to have a recorded interview with Jonathan Tilly, who's an um, expert at marketing and uh, mm-hmm. you know, in English and in German. Right. Which is He's based in Germany. Yeah. And then on November 5th, we have Rosie and Brian Amador and their daughter Elise. Sol y Canto, we're going to have a live backyard concert here at the uh, next to our clubhouse here, which will be a so lot So that means we have to have more than two mics? More than two. Oh, God. More than two mics. <laughs> and a sound system. And it's all the other be, things that go along with that. It's going to be so fun. Though. I'm, I be, love doing stuff That'll like be that. great. Okay. Great people. Who are our donors of the week who we greatly appreciate? Yeah, I will tell you. Because uh, they're four, very important. Six, eight. Who to do we appreciate? Our donors. Our donors. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got donors, donations from Tracy H. Reynolds, like you hear his name every week, as well as Andrew Kaufman and Eric Aragoni every week. Every week. Um, thank you, all of you gentlemen. And we have Don Griffith, subscriber, Martha Kahn. Martha. Thank you, Martha. He's na- I mean, some of these folks we know IRL in real life. Others we don't, but we just seem feel like we know them because they donate every mm-hmm. And Every, when we meet them at conferences, it's like they know thank us. You. It's really weird. Shana Pennington Baird. Um, or is it Shauna? She's going to tell me someday when I actually meet her in person. Antland Productions. That's Uncle Roy, as you as you guys know. Joseph Valentinetti. Hope you said. I hope I said that right. Hey, I know that name. He just hired me for something. Thanks. Double dipping. Uh, <laughs> Diana Birdsall and Stephanie Sutherland. Oh, so that's a, that's a couple of new names in there. All right. Let's if you want to work with George, where do you go? You go to georgethetech.com, and if you like short, geeky URLs, just go to georgethe.tech. All right. And if you want to work with me, you go to homevoiceoverstudio.com. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes we actually talk about these things together, and then sometimes we hide things from each other. <laughs> what? But, you know, well, maybe maybe I do occasionally. Uh, anyway, uh, let's see here. We're live here Mondays, Monday nights, most Monday nights. You want to be here in our audience, our live audience, and see how this show is done. All you have to do is write to us at theguys at vobs.tv if you happen to be in the greater Los Angeles area. And we pretty much start on time, so get most here on of the time, time, and we won't we'll, keep you too late. That's right. And if you start show up really late, sometimes that makes us late. <laughs> so be here on time. Stay off the 405. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the show logs are now automatic. That's right. We'd like to thank Jack DeGoli for doing it all these years. All but, those years. But now Facebook or is it, is it, uh, uh, YouTube, actually YouTube, YouTube does it. By transcriptions itself. automatic. How do they do it? What so that do means Jack all... is no longer going to be typing and learning everything that goes on in the show. I know, but he'll still be watching. Uh, let's see. Show us your booths because tonight this is Jack Daniels booth. Oh, <laughs> See, I mean, the guy just totally geeks out. I mean, look, yeah, move, move a, a little wide move, shot. Move, yeah, get a little more wide shot. You can see how he really geeks out here. This is a, a beautiful studio. Beautiful. Jack, Jack has you. Have, you bring more than one person in there sometimes, or for like teaching, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he has more Which than is one why person. It in looks there. so nice. Yeah. Even though most people don't need to see how this sausage yeah, it's is. Yes, your made. personal, private person. What do we What do we call them nowadays? We came your up with a personal. Name. Uh, professional voiceover yeah. studio. Yeah, they don't, they don't have to look that nice, but Jack put the extra effort in. Right. And because he's a classy guy. Yeah. That's right. All right. Uh, okay. I have an Instagram account, George the Tech, on Instagram. I'm starting to post on there here and there, just fun little things. Yeah. And... Uh, they got that geeky podcast I do called the Pro Audio Suite with uh, Andrew Peters and Darren Robertson from Australia and Robert Marshall from Source Elements. That's right. uh, every, every couple of weeks. Put that out. Okay, and I've got my new website, voiceovergear.com. If you're interested Man. in reviews of voiceover gear, if I don't like it, it doesn't get on there. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm you know, I'm very honest and very critical. So if gotta you, be if it's on there, you don't you didn't read the ones I didn't like very mm-hmm. much. Good. Uh, okay. Well, acknowledgments. First off, we need to thank our sponsors, Harlan Hogan's Voiceover Essentials. Pregnant pause. Voiceover extra. 
Alrighty. Source elements. Vo to go go. Voice actor websites dot com. And J Michael Collins demos. Alrighty. Well, we also need to thank, of course, the Dan and Marcy Leonard Foundation for the betterment of live webcasting. <laughs> for making sure this all happens. That's right. Our producer, Catherine Curridan, for getting us great guests. That's like right. tonight, like Phil and Ariana Ratner. Yeah. Which was and fabulous. She just had a birthday yes. recently. I happy saw Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday. Well, we, said, we said happy to birthday to her on, on yeah. uh, Facebook. Yeah. Jack Daniel doing an amazing job in the chat room tonight. And of course, our crack technical director, Sue Merlino, for getting it together and making it seem effortless. <laughs> Thank you, Sue. All right. And of course, Lee Penny simply for being. Sue, Lee you put Penny. up with a lot of crap. She sure does. Well, that's going to do it for us tonight. Uh, you know, it's a tough business. We're here to help you out. But mostly, we want to make, let you know that if it sounds good, it is good. All righty. Well, that's going to do it for us tonight. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Widow. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS. Yes. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next time.